is whether it was big Dr. Orton Boyd, you're on mute. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to the B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month Symposium which is held each year in honor of a trailblazer who fought to the end of her life to raise awareness of mental illness in families and communities of color. On behalf of the B.B. Moore Campbell Mental Health Task Force, Judy Moore Ladder, Regina Mallory Campbell, Patrice Gaines, Nicole Walker Parks, Ellis Gordon, and Courtney Lang, I greet you with love and gratitude and a heart full of joy. Our mission is to preserve the name of B.B. Moore Campbell to this congressionally dedicated month as we raise awareness and erase the stigma of mental illness that impacts so many communities. And we want to ensure that people are aware of services available to them. Your presence here today is an indication that you too believe in the need to address mental illness in our community. B.B. Moore Campbell was an author, a journalist, a teacher, a classmate, and she was known as one of the most prolific authors in America today. She's the author of three New York Times bestsellers, Brothers and Sisters, Singing in the Comeback Choir, and What You Owe Me which was also a Los Angeles Times best book of 2001. Her other work include the novel, Your Blues Ain't Like Mine's, which was a New York Times notable book of the year. And she was the winner of the NAACP Image Award for Literature and her memoir, Sweet Summer, Growing Up With and Without My Dad. Her first non-fictional book was Successful Women, Angry Men, The Backlash in a Two-Career Marriage. Her essays, articles, and excerpts appear in many anthologies. You may recall that in 2008, Congress passed a resolution that established the month of July as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. This month was dedicated to raise awareness to the need to improve access to mental health treatment and services, to address the need for improved access to care, treatment and services for those diagnosed with severe or persistent mental health disorders, and to enhance public awareness of mental illness and mental illness among minority groups. So we thank you today for connecting with us. And we are so proud of our devoted partners, the American Psychiatric Society Association, I'm sorry, APA, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, the DC chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Hillcrest Children and Family Center, Co-Lang Partners. And this year, we're proud to add DC HealthLink, the ACA online marketplace in Washington, DC, and Defensive Line, an organization devoted to ending, ending the epidemic of youth suicide, especially for young people of color. We acknowledge the support and dedication of NAMI Urban Los Angeles and the dynamic work they do to raise awareness under the direction of their president, Dr. Lynn Goodlow. And also we want to acknowledge Ellis Gordon, who's the former husband of the late B.B. Moore Campbell, who could not be with us today, but we acknowledge him and his ever presence in all that we do. We also acknowledge B.B.'s granddaughter, Alicia Gutierrez, who's also carrying on the work of her grandmother and has been with us in previous symposium. But today, as we embark upon Erase the Stigma, Not Her Name Symposium, our theme is Black Boys and Men, Mental Health Crisis, Care, and Community. 
Today, we will explore the alarming rise of mental illness among our young boy children and adult men. Suicide among black male youth is growing at an alarming rate and it demands urgent attention from local leaders, from schools, healthcare systems, families, community-based organization, faith-based institution. Everyone needs to know about this crisis. There is a need both to spotlight this issue and to deploy effective solutions for identifying young people at risk and getting them the help that they need. Black males tend to comprise a large majority of suicide victims. They're typically three to six times more likely to die by suicide than black females are and comprise as much as 80% of the black suicide victims. An often overlooked silent killer, mental illness with its devastating tentacles affects multiple generations of families of color and must and must be addressed. We come today with an array of experts and thought leaders to raise awareness about mental health disorders in our communities, to help us recognize the signs of the disease and the need for resources and tools to help address this most pressing issue that holds far too many young men and boys from living out their God-given potential. We're here to advocate on the advancement of culturally sensitive treatment options and community service to address the racial disparities that impact treatment and research, and to highlight the need for a village approach of community partnerships to address this illness. Before we get started though, let's hear from the person who made it possible to main, name July as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Month, the Honorable Albert Wynn. Albert worked tirelessly to spearhead the designation of July as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. When we asked for his help, Albert never hesitated. He said yes. So it's my pleasure to introduce my friend and former congressman from Prince George's County, Maryland, and Pitt alum, Albert Russell Wynn. Hey, well, thank you very much, Linda. Uh, and again, good afternoon, good morning, depending upon your location, but mainly welcome. We are delighted that you are here uh, joining us in this symposium to recognize B.B. Moore Campbell, our leader and pathfinder, and her dream, the National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, as Linda mentioned, Phoebe was a classmate of ours at the University of, of, of Pittsburgh. She was a wonderful person, calm, inclusive, spiritual, someone you knew for all the right reasons, uh, someone you probably call it in these days an old soul. But she certainly was a, a wonderful person with great respect for everyone. As we all know, she became a renowned author and spoke to the crisis and stigma of mental health in the African-American community. Uh, to that extent, she was both a pathfinder and a catalyst. Like many of you, uh, mental illness has impacted my family. And I think this is just a wonderful issue for all of us to, to take up. Uh, the story is, and Linda gave me more credit than I deserve, uh, she called me and said, one of our classmates, B.B. Moore Campbell's last wishes was that there be such a month, a official congressional recognition of National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month for the month of July. I, in turn, reached out to former Congresswoman Diane Watson, who was a California Congresswoman uh, representing uh, B.B. Moore Campbell. And together we worked to, to get this uh, resolution in order and on May 21st, 2008, uh, the resolution passed the Congress of the United States of America. And I can recall at that time, I was obviously very excited. And I said to Linda, the only thing is, I know for a fact that many of these months uh, are symbolic only. Nothing happens afterwards, no work is done and nothing proceeds after the resolution, resolution and the reading and all of, all of that. And she assured me, she said, don't worry, we're going to make it happen. This is going to be real. This is going to work and it's going to grow. And it has, and your presence here today is indicative of that. So to that extent, I want to say thank you. I'm glad my worst fears were not recognized. But in fact, 
uh, all of my expectations were exceeded by all the people and partners who've come together to make this uh, ongoing success. That said, I turn the microphone back to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Linda Wooden Board. Thank you so much, Albert. Let me turn this over to one of our partners, Dan Gillison. Dan Gillison serves as the Chief Executive Officer of NAMI, and he provides strategic leadership to this organization for more than 30, with his more than 30 years of professional experience and a deep passion for mental health advocacy, which is fueled by personal lived experiences with mental illness and its ripple effect on families. He also currently serves as the National Institute of Health Advisory Mental Health Council, the Lululemon Global Wellbeing Advisory Board, the National Health Council Board of Directors, and the Austin Riggs Center Board of Trustees. Dan has several numerous, I should say, awards for his work in advancing mental illness. And we are so proud to have him as a partner in this fight for better services for our people. I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Dr. Boyd, thank you. And um, um, Black Boys and Men, Mental Health Crisis Care and Community. Uh, it is uh, so good to be with everyone. I'll tell you a little bit about NAMI and uh, I'll be as crisp as possible. We're the largest grassroots mental health organization comprised of lived experience. And we're dedicated to building better lives for millions of uh, people affected by mental health conditions. Uh, we're in over 650 communities. Uh, providing support, education, advocacy, and awareness, all focused on ensuring anyone affected by mental health conditions is surrounded by a community that cares. Uh, and the problem in front of us uh, is enormous and growing more urgent. So if we can go to the first slide, and I only have a few. So if we can move to that, that would be outstanding. Um, as you as you see the numbers right here, let me just speak to it. Um, nearly two in three Black adults with a mental health condition did not receive treatment in the past year. Uh, uh, flip that, you're talking about only 33% did receive, so it's 66% that didn't. NAMI believes that every person deserves the opportunity to lead a healthy and fulfilling life. Unfortunately, our current mental health crisis poses an unprecedented threat to that opportunity for Black men and boys. Now, I came to this work because I see the challenges that my own family, my colleagues, and my contemporaries face. This work is personal. In 1986, I lost my contemporary to suicide in Washington, D.C. So as we think about this and as we look at this need, we also know that men don't make time for our well-being. Rates of suicide deaths among Black men have increased by 25% over the last two decades. Tragically, suicide attempts in Black adolescents rose by 73% over the last two decades. So if we can go to the next slide, I, I want to I mention something right here and just pause in, 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 my, in my short statement. Thanks to our work with Jansen and Courtney Lang and Langco Partners, who you will hear from today, we at NAMI are working on the Community Health Equity Alliance, or what we call CHIA, which is designed to create community level solutions to improve access to care for people in Black and African ancestry communities experiencing serious mental health conditions. CHIA is about improving care navigation so people know where to turn for care and who to call and how to engage for those with the most serious conditions. This is especially important in the Black and African ancestry communities in which only 39% of Black Americans receive mental health treatment. Uh, and now if we can go to the next slide, we've created a campaign. So we launched a campaign called Crisis Can't Wait. And this is through CHIA, because this is a crisis that cannot wait. And it's to share high impact resources with Black and African ancestry communities, especially around 988, but also focused on three key areas. Know the signs, so people know the signs of serious mental health concerns and when a call to 988 or seeking services is needed. Uh, passing it on, telling others, uh, making sure we amplify that there is this, this new number that can be used. And know your care journey, just like if you have diabetes, if you have some other physical ailment, you know your journey. Know your journey as you're navigating your mental health and your mental wellness. Through the Crisis Can't Wait campaign and because it involves community solutions, we're working with NAMI state, 
and affiliate leaders and key partners and stakeholders in spreading the word about 988. This includes faith leaders, members of the Divine Nine, provider organizations, and other community organizations. You can learn about CHIA and the Crisis Can't Wait campaign at uh, uh, chia.nami.org. Uh, we like to say in terms of our 650 affiliates that we're the DNA in the communities. Part of that DNA is because of the work of Courtney Lang and the work of our affiliates in terms of outreach to, uh, to our community. What you see here is the, and what you, what you heard uh, earlier is about the faith community. Many turn to trusted faith leaders uh, when a person experiences a, a serious mental health crisis. Now, that faith leader is the first person they go to because that's who they trust. Faith leaders reach out to NAMI for resources to support individuals and families. Spirituality is a key factor for many reaching and sustaining recovery. NAMI sponsors an annual Pathway to Hope conference with faith leaders, NAMI field leaders, and others. And we also have two programs, one called Sharing Hope and the other one called Compartiendo Esperanza. They're designed to introduce discussions on mental health and wellness to Black and African ancestry communities through a three-part community conversation series grounded in sacred storytelling and guided dialogue on mental wellness and support. Um, next slide. Here's, here's, here's the wrap up for me. Um, how I met B.B. Moore Campbell, I was with some of her classmates from the University of Pittsburgh, and I uh, had a mentor, uh, David Garnett, and he uh, invited me over to his home, said, I have a friend coming over for uh, dinner, and um, she has a new book, and we'd just like you to come on over and meet her and you and your wife and have a good evening. I did not know in 2005 that I would be doing this work and that this meeting was serendipitous. So uh, who is B.B. Uh, Moore Campbell? And we have to make sure going forward that this month is B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Month. You've heard about her, but in terms of NAMI, she was a founder of NAMI Inglewood. And that became uh, later became NAMI Urban LA. Uh, and you've heard that she established Minority Mental Health Task Force. Uh, and many of the, you, we're talking about the B.B. Moore Campbell uh, Minority Task Force now. And, and the biggest thing I can say is that uh, who you see there is a, is a father, who you see there in this picture is a mother. And we, kind, we, we brought back both of that to, to this work. And I would offer to you that I'm so proud to, to, uh, to, to be doing this work. And we um, um, have done something that I wanted to share with you. Uh, our Awareness Month, B.B. Moore Campbell Awareness Month Toolkit has had over 1,500 downloads so far this month. The press release that we sent out has a potential reach of over 165 million people. Now, B.B. Uh, Moore uh, Campbell, she fearlessly and tirelessly worked every day to ensure that no one would ever feel ashamed of struggling with their mental health and that everyone could have awareness of and access to culturally competent resources uh, to allow them to live a life filled with the most basic rights to their health, happiness, and physical and psychological safety. It's a reminder to me every day uh, that uh, I am standing on the shoulders of giants in the work that I'm doing. And this is an opportunity to give back in such a tremendous way. And I just wanna thank all of you all for being here, the audience for being here, and for what every one of you all do. Uh, Dr. Boyd, I'll pass it back to you now. Thank you so much, Gann. And we, we really appreciate all the work that NAMI does all the time with us and with others. So thank you for your leadership. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Nicole. Nicole is a member of the task force, and she's going to introduce our next speaker. Nicole? Good afternoon and good morning to um, those that are on the West Coast. My name is Nicole Parks. I am a member of the B.B. Moore Campbell Minority Mental Health task force, as well as I am a school counselor for Prince George's County Public Schools. I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Marquita Willis. Dr. Marquita Willis is a CEO and mental director for the American Psychiatric Association. On June 1st, 2024, she assumed the helm of the APAs as the eighth CEO and became the black first Black American and first woman to occupy the critical role for the 100 an 80-year-old professional society. So we're really excited about that. Dr. Willis is passionate about collaboration and innovation in order to deliver patient-centered, high-quality, equitable, efficient, and affordable care. 
Most recently, Dr. Willis served as the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for John Hopkins Health Plans. In her role, Dr. Willis helped JHHP organize clinical and quality outcomes for health plan members while driving efforts to efficient, efficiently manage cost of care. Dr. Willis has worked as a consultant at McKenzie and Company and was the director of physician affairs at the Medical Center campus of Memorial Hermann Hospital Systems, where she oversaw the medical staff office and physicians recruitment, contracting and onboarding. Dr. Willis earned her medical degree from the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and completed a residency in adult psychiatric at Harvard Massachusetts General Hospital, as well as McLean Hospital Program, serving as the chief resident in her last year. She also has a master's in business from the Wharton School of Business from the University of Pennsylvania. We're so excited and we hope that we continue our association as well as our partnership with the American Psychiatric Association. Please welcome Dr. Marquita Willis. Hello there. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I truly appreciate it. I am delighted uh, to be uh, here on this uh, important, important uh, call today, uh, celebrating the life of B.B. Moore Campbell um, and celebrating her so named National Minority Mental Health Month, which is such an important month for all of us. Um, I am particularly energized um, by the constellation at, of talent on the symposium and the laser focus on Black male mental health, uh, because as we know, there is an epidemic, quite frankly, on Black male mental health, and it's gone quiet, and I'm glad that this group is shining a bright light on that epidemic so that we can all together band together to create solutions community by community across our nation. Um, I think others have shared some of the statistics here or just a few more. Uh, third leading cause of death for black male adolescents and black male young adults now is suicide. Um, in the past two decades, suicide attempts rose by 7% for Black adolescents, um, and attempts increased by 122% for Black adolescent boys. Um, in the same time span, suicide death among Black men increased 25%. So... Um, I think we all on this call will agree there is cause for concern. This is a public health crisis uh, that we all need to work together to address. Um, and uh, I am very proud to be part of this group uh, uh, that is doing just that. Um, at APA, uh, we do have resources available that have been created by our Office of Diversity and Health Equity, um, which is uh, staffed by my colleague, um, Dr. Regina James and her team, including Gabriel Esquiantres. Um, and they have developed resources for psychiatrists, that's our membership. We're comprised of 39,000 psychiatrists across America, um, a resource guide for psychiatrists to be able to better meet the needs of their Black patients, whether they be Black, White, uh, Hispanic, Asian. We want to arm and equip our psychiatrists to be culturally sensitive and provide that culturally tailored care. Um, and so uh, a, a resource guide was developed. I'm sorry, uh, if you just could just go back once one moment. A resource guide was developed, uh, a, a webinar series uh, where we bring luminaries in the field 
uh, to talk about the mental health of historically marginalized and minoritized communities. Um, and then we have a series where we've also partnered with Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, their center of excellence, um, to bring awareness to disparities in care uh, for Black people in general, including Black men. Um, and we're very proud of these resource documents that have been developed. Um, and we have had very positive response to them. So please share the word that these are available to psychiatrists who may need them. Um, next slide. Um, we also have, um, and this is really the centerpiece of the division's work, an APA More Equity in Mental Health Initiative, which proudly celebrates uh, National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and there are a bevy of activities um, that are designed through this program, including walks, symposiums, et cetera. Um, and the point of these are to uh, have community-based activities promoting mental health equity, uh, especially for young people of color through education, outreach, and advocacy. I know we have uh, an event coming up uh, this Saturday, a walk. We also have an event next week uh, with the Marion Berry Youth Consortium. Um, so we're very excited about our extensive programming, um, particularly around uh, this month. And so um, I bring you greetings from our board. Um, and am, again, delighted for the opportunity to be able to partner. Thank you for giving us the space uh, to work with you and to provide these opening remarks. Um, I hope this is an amazing symposium. I know the agenda is quite robust. And with that, I will turn it back over to the moderator. Hello. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Judy Moore Latta, and I'm a member of the B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Task Force. And we are here in conversation today because the mental health crisis facing Black boys and men is at an epidemic level. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first panel made up of two people who are tackling this head on. And they are here to help us get a handle on the seriousness and the extent of the crisis. Our first speaker is Dr. Regina S. James from the American Psychiatric Association. And she is the deputy medical director and uh, chief of the Division of Diversity and Health Equity at APA. Uh, Dr. James is a child and adolescent psychiatrist with over 25 years of experience in carrying out national and international health disparity programs and initiatives for children and families. And she's an award-winning leader in promoting and developing scientific programs that address gaps in minority health and, and healthcare disparities. And, she, and she's served as a, a special expert um, providing child psychiatric and clinical research consultation, seeing the crisis really firsthand. Our second speaker uh, will be Dr. Jay Barnett, author, former NFL player, mental health therapist, life coach. Jay Barnett is on a mission to empower and inspire and ignite a fire into the minds of people. And he has more than 10 years of experience as an acclaimed youth mentor and motivational speaker. And he's translated the lessons and strategies learned on the field into meaningful lessons for life. And he created a personal and social development program called the King Program. He runs a nonprofit and does online mental, uh, mental health and life coaching for teens, as well as holistic well-being training for corporations. And he is the author of several best-selling books, including Hello King, a widely acclaimed book for young men. A native of Mississippi, 
who currently resides in Texas. He was featured as the 2019 Black Enterprise Modern Man of the Year. Please welcome first, Dr. Regina James, who will be followed by Dr. Jay Barnett. Thank you so much, Judy Morlana. And, and thank you for saying I'm an award winning. Uh, I like to see those awards, please. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so if I can have the first slide, please. So I wanted to start off with this slide because it really should be at the headline on newspapers and social media about what we're talking about today. And that is the rising rate of suicide among our black men and boys. But as the next slide will show you, this is really not the case. It is truly a silent epidemic. It truly is. And I think the word epidemic has been mentioned this morning. Crisis has been mentioned this morning. Yet, the suicide rates continue to increase. Now, as you can see in the next slide, we actually have been trying to bring attention to this. There was first ring the alarm. That was in 2019, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman released this the task force report really with data, recommendations about what we can do. That's when we started to ring the alarm. My next slide will show you 2023, Johns Hopkins School of, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health is still ringing the alarm, right? We're still dealing with this issue. The rates are still rising. They provided great recommendations and next steps. So although it's a silent epidemic, we have these rising rates, there has been documentation and publications, it is still not getting the attention that it so needs. My next slide actually, it was a disturbing actually piece of data. So given that the CDC has reported these rising rates and statistics around suicide rates, in our black boys and men. According to the study by Rocket and colleagues, this actual suicide rate may be an underestimation. Yeah, let that sink in. It may be an underestimation because it shows, the, the research shows that black American deaths are 2.3 times more likely than white deaths to be classified as undetermined. So if it's undetermined, it really can't be classified as a suicide. So we really may be looking at truly higher rates, which is really sad. Next slide. And looking at our young Black people in general, over 85% of the suicides are actually either due to suffocation or firearms. And for our young Black boys, it's actually firearms are the most common method of suicide. So what are the risk factors? You know, we talk about risk factors for suicide and in general, you know, it's like a prior attempt of suicide or a history of mental illness or substance use. But then there are some nuances. There's some risk factors I think that are more unique for our black boys and men. And I'm gonna kind of break it down, starting from a societal level and going down to an individual level. But you'll see one key string that, that seems to keep flowing, and that's gonna be around racism and discrimination. So let's start on the societal level. Increased risk factors, institutional racism, the school to prison pipeline that they tend to be a part of, unfortunately, and stigma that's associated with actually seeking help for mental illness and substance use disorders. From a community level, again, violence, exposure to police violence, um, and access, just having access to quality healthcare. From a relationship person to person level, we're looking again at experiencing racial discrimination and other forms of discrimination. And then from an individual level, is adverse childhood experiences. So we're talking about abuse, neglect, again, violence, racism, discrimination. So these are some unique things that our black boys and men experience that may put them at higher risk that we really need to pay more attention to. But then on the positive side, the next slide will show you some of our protective factors. 
And I think some of these were mentioned earlier. Spirituality or being engaged in faith-based organizations is a strong point. Having support from friends and family members and strong racial identity. Let me say that again, strong racial identity as a protective factor, which is really important. So the last two points I wanna make is first, the importance of screening. It, this is a vital first step in terms of identifying risk for suicide. And fortunately, I think it was back in 2022, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and this may be mentioned later because we have a number of representatives uh, or pediatricians, um, recommended that pediatricians screen for suicide from age 12 and, and above. And so this is a great step to begin to identify and then also to begin to refer them to the appropriate you know, sources and the appropriate follow-up and get the appropriate care. So screening for suicide risk is really important. So this was a key first step back in 2022 recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. The second thing I wanted to point out was the role of schools. Our kids spend over 95% of their time in schools. So school-based mental health services can truly bring treatment to young people who might otherwise have trouble accessing care. But we all know that due to budget cuts and smaller budgets and, and, and amount of money that can be you know, attributed to um, school-based mental health services, there's also a foundational level of things that can be done to connect students, which could also be helpful in the, in the school arena. So for example, connecting students to their classmates and communities through school-based clubs and community outreach. So at the very least, having these sort of pieces in place in the schools uh, can help us um, in, this, in this dilemma that we're facing. So before I pass the virtual mic on to my uh, colleague, Dr. Jay Barnett, I just wanted to reemphasize we have rang the alarm. We are still ringing the alarm. Now it's time to turn the alarm off, get up, and we need to get to work. And as I've mentioned before, on all levels, no matter how small or big you can contribute, whether it's an individual level, whether it's on a community level, whether it's working on a policy level, whether it's working on a research level, we really need to address this issue of rising race. This is not a myth that death by suicide in Black communities does not exist. This is real, and we really need to begin to wake up and really do something about this. So with that, I'm going to pass the virtual mic over to Dr. Jay Barnett. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I know you guys on the East Coast. I'm in the West Coast. So uh, it's still morning here, so if my voice sounds a little raspy, it's because I haven't uh, fully, I, I guess, got to, you know, you know how it is when you're waking up first thing in the morning. So, uh, but uh, I just want to say thank you uh, to the APA uh, for the opportunity to be the Grand Marshal uh, for the second year. Thank you to Dr. James. Uh, thank you to Gabriel. Uh, thank you to Ms. Linda, uh, to the individuals who stand behind this movement. Uh, and, and more importantly, stand behind this mission that BB led and that her name is still being recognized and we're still saying her name and that the impact of her work is still uh, affecting lives of many from the mental, uh, emotional and the psychological space. Um, as Dr. James has given you guys the statistics, um, she's sort of given you uh, the kind of the research surrounding black men, black boys and their mental health. I come to you today, uh, I just want to speak to your heart briefly for just a few minutes. Uh, I am a lived experience. Uh, I am a two-time suicide survivor. I travel all over this country sharing my story. Um, I almost was a statistic of, of someone that would have died by way of suicide, by a statistic when it comes to attempts. Uh, at 13, I fell into deep depression because of the divorce of my parents. My father was a uh, well-known pastor. And so that uh, really broke me because not only did our family break, but I also lost uh, that model. I lost that person that I looked after. And I began cutting. 
and this self-harm began at an early age. And when I was cut from football, I reverted back to that. And my first attempt was that I slipped my wrist. My second attempt was a drug overdose. I was found. And I'm saying this because in the slide where Dr. James talked about this is a silent epidemic, it's a silent epidemic because the way we have been socialized as black boys and black men is that we don't have a voice. And then the only way that we can use our voice is usually in places where we're not heard. And this has trained our brain. This has trained the programming of how we function in today's society that if I'm hurting, I can't tell anyone because I don't want anyone to know my pain. And if you know my pain, I now have to question how you see me. How do you view me in my masculine energy? Do you think I'm feminine? Do you think I'm sensitive? And so when you think about these things uh, from the perspective that it's a silent epidemic, it's because we don't talk as men. And this is why I am advocating always for active listening sessions when it comes to black boys and black men, because we've had people trying to treat us who don't understand us. And if you don't have a level of cultural sensitivity, cultural competency, you definitely don't understand that cultural humility is needed when you're treating me because it has to be contextualized in a way that you not only understand my blackness, but you understand the challenges historically that have already programmed my brain to see myself less than. So why would I care for my mental health? And when I don't care for my mental health, why would I care for your well-being? So it's nothing for me to take another person's life. Because when you look at the act of violence, it's unprocessed trauma. It's unprocessed pain. And when brothers cannot process, they become one or two things. You either homicidal or suicidal. So we have a generation of men that are crying out silently. And what I love about what you guys are doing is giving voice to the voiceless, it's giving space. Because what is critical for us as men is that I don't want to be told it's a safe space, but then my pain is exploited. I don't want to be told to open up, and then what I share with you is now used against me. So all of these different factors play a role in our mental health. Now, in closing, here is what I would love to see that I think that the APA is already doing a great job is understanding messaging and marketing. I work tirelessly to continue to not just share my story, but be a part of the solution. So it was important for me to not only go back and become a therapist, but also to earn my doctorate because I understand the challenges at the micro level, but also understanding the power that I have at a macro level to be a part of policies, to be a part of great initiatives such as this B.B. Moore Campbell and change in the way that we see black and brown youth and how we treat preventative care. But it's so important and imperative that we really look at the social determinants that when we are thinking about black boys, we have to think about the determinants of their environments, their community, their access to care. And let's be honest, we are gonna to have to take the care to them because it's gonna take some time for brothers to feel open to say, I need help. And what my message is to brother, it's okay to not be okay. So I just wanted to kind of echo what Dr. James shared. Uh, and to provide some context and to really give some understanding to where we are, what it looks like in real time. Because let me tell you, if you saw me as a football player, you would have never thought that I was suicidal with depression because oftentimes the pain is not seen visibly when it is being harbored internally. So what we're doing here is not just necessary, but it is transformative work to continue to expand the message and the movement and to expand uh, this reach for the work that we're all doing. Thank you, Dr. James, and thank you, Dr. Barnett. I do appreciate individuals are using the Q&A function. If you have any questions for Dr. James or Dr. Um, Barnett, do feel free and put them in there. Um, if not, we will also be taking questions at the very end after all sessions are done. But after each session, we have just a handful of minutes in case there's questions. And there is a question. How important is hope? as you both were speaking about the topic and the issue, how important would you say hope is? I'll let Dr. Barnett start. Hope is very important. Uh, without hope, 
uh, there's no act of belief. Uh, there's no act of seeing yourself beyond the other side. And hope is also uh, that element, that tenant uh, uh, to help a, a brother say, I want to look for a change. And when I begin looking for a change, then I begin opening for a change. So hope is very important. And I think we have a generation of hopeless men. And when you have men that are hopeless, you have men that are not going to show up and they're not going to be open uh, to receiving care because they have lost all motivation, aspiration, inspiration. So hope is very necessary. And that's what this work has to be about. It's giving them hope so they can choose the healing, choose the therapy, choose the care for themselves. And I would just add that hope really encompasses expectation. So if you expect to be better, if you expect to do better, if you expect that things are going to be uh, a more positive outcome, that is very powerful. So as Dr. Barnett said, hope is is, is truly the key. Um, but with hope, there's that element of trust as well. Um, but hope is definitely a key and a first step. You have to have that expectation of that positive outcome. I'll ask two more questions and then we'll save the rest for the open Q&A. So what are some practical ways that a therapist could provide a space for Black men? Dr. Barnett, I'll follow you. <laughs> All right. So I, here's one of the ways to understand is providing the space will have to be unconventional. Black men are different. I just want to tell you that Black men are different. Uh, I'll give an example. Whenever I see Black boys, I always find unique things about them to connect with them. You cannot try to open people up without trying to get to know them. The first two sessions uh, uh, when I was in private practice, it was never about what they were there for. I wanted to know about them because as I learn about them, that builds trust. Therapy and effective therapy is about the relationship. So if you're wanting to build space for men, get to know me as the man before you're trying to understand my issue. Because if you get to know me as a man, I feel comfortable and I can let my wall down so you can identify with those things or those patterns and all those different elements that is connected to why I'm really there. It's no different than having a primary care doctor. You're not gonna be open with your doctor about things that are going on inside of you until you have that level of trust. And I think that is critical uh, to providing space for black men. Just add with that, particularly with young black boys, um, it's very important at some point to engage the parents or the caretakers because all the talk that you give within a room one on one may or may not be carried out if the family is not engaged. So it's very important to engage parents, caretakers, uh, along with this process, this healing process. Thank you both. We will have more questions towards the end during the open Q&A. But for now, I want to thank you both. And I will pass the virtual baton to Keith. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a nice uh, transition to the next segment uh, for our next panel. And what we wanted to do was take a moment to hear from someone about his own lived experience. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Brandon Williams. He is 21 years old. He just had a birthday yesterday. So happy birthday, Brandon. And he grew up in DC, but now lives in Maryland. But Brandon, what would you like us to know about your experience? Thank you for the birthday wishes as well. Um, so today, hello, my name is Brandon Williams, I'm 21. I'll be a junior this year at Morgan State University. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my experiences. Um, so I grew up playing football. I dreamed of being in the NFL. I loved the game, the brotherhood, the coaches who were like mentors and the cheering crowd and the fame. I was recruited by a prestigious private high school with a well-known football team, but I ended up failing the school's math entrance exam and had to um, end up going to a public high school in DC. At first, it was a rough start with school and adapting to the next level of football. My junior year, I ended up playing a lot and started to get a lot of recognition throughout the metropolitan area. 
and we're getting interest from many colleges and some offer me scholarships. Um, COVID ended up happening before my senior year. So they announced that there would be no in-person school or football season. I was devastated at the moment uh, because I felt um, I had the chance to showcase my talents at an all-time high, but it was taken from me. I feel like my biggest loss throughout that year was, although not having a football season, but was not having a senior night to have all my friends and family there um, for my last home game. Um, due to my junior uh, year film and attending many camps while COVID was going on, Morgan State University offered me a football scholarship in 2021. Schools began to open back up and I was finally getting ready to get back on the field. During our preseason physical, the doctor found that I had a torn labrum and three torn ligaments in my shoulder. The, the doctor instructed me to play with the shoulder brace and have surgery after the season. So I was real skeptical about what I was gonna do at the moment. We ended up having a bad season and our whole coaching staff was fired. I was in rehab, but I could feel that my shoulder was never gonna be the same. Um, at that moment, I felt my NFL dreams were slipping away. I felt really down. I know mentally I was not myself. Everything started to go downhill, such as getting bad grades in school, losing 50% of my scholarship. I just I felt I gave up and I wanted to go home. My, um, my parents, they, they got me a therapist. And with talking to a therapist, I learned that it was important to talk about talk to my parents about my feelings. Um, I learned that I had to take, take accountability for my decisions. For the first time since I was six, I was football was not in my life. People around campus knew me as a football player, but I didn't know who I was outside of football. With help from my therapist and my parents, I discovered other things I love, but at the moment I'm still in the process of finding my own identity. Um, although my life wouldn't be the same, I had to realize it's okay to embrace the emotional journey I was going through. Um, right now, I like to check out podcasts such as Nightcap, Million Dollars Worth the Game, and the Joe Rogan Experience, where they talk about their lives and give life-changing advice that can be very beneficial to young men. From time to time, me and my friends talk about what's going on in our lives. I feel like it helps us not only with our mental, but with also our communication skills. Um, with that being said, I want to thank the B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Task Force because of the work like yours, me and my friends know it's important to check on each other. We are able to talk about therapy and mental health without any shame. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Keith Montgomery. I'm the executive director of the DC chapter of the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics. And for our next uh, panel, we're going to have three people join us to talk about mental health treatment, intervention, um, and prevention, as well as health benefits and health benefit structures, more equitable uh, designs. So uh, I want to introduce our first two doctors, Dr. Melissa Long and Dr. Jory Jones. They're both community pediatricians with Children's National Primary Care, uh, and they are joined by Pervy Kemp, Deputy, Deputy Executive Director of DC's uh, Health Benefit Exchange Authorities. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Long. Who's going to turn it over to Dr. Jones? <laughs> okay, sorry, I had the wrong All right. word. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm Dr. Jones. Uh, Dr. Long and I uh, work in D.C. with uh, Black children from low-income households. Um, I was inspired through my work with the, this patient population to start a nonprofit um, called Raising Risers with the um, goal of nurturing and supporting Black children. My first event was in February, where we hosted a community-based empowerment um, workshop and it centered Black boys. Um, the following clip that you'll see is just um, 
uh, a snippet of the stories from Black men from the community and how they learned how to manage their emotions. So you can go ahead to the next slide. My dad taught me to like just hold it within. Um, if you express yourself, uh, the man in charge of your job will look at, look at you as not a man. All right, so um, I wasn't allowed to feel. Uh, I was raised in a household where as a boy, you can be mad or sad. And if you're sad, it has to be because somebody died. This trauma that we navigate, um, I don't think we speak to it enough. Um, leaving Chicago and looking back, I realized nothing was wrong with us as individuals. We were all just PTSD victims, and we were being raised by a generation of traumatized people who were raised by a generation of traumatized people that you can go all the way back. When I was younger, I was so angry. Um... Like, I, when I recall, like, in sixth to seventh grade, I got in 12 fights in school. Wow. Like, in school, 12 fights. And it's like... Were you the aggressor, or were you defending yourself? Defending myself, but it was like I was aggressively defending myself, right? So it's like, um, it's like, <laughs> it's like um, if you say something to me, you don't have to necessarily hit me for me to be de defending myself, you know what I mean? So it's like, I was, uh, I was aggressive, I was an aggressive defender. But, um... No one, people saw me and I got, you know, in trouble, but like no one saw me. No one engaged with me, right? Um, in the household, um, my mother, she was, and I hate to use, even use this term, but she was what you think like a strong black woman, right? And because she had to be, she had, she was, a, she was raised by a single parent. Her mother grew up, was on drugs, right? So she was really raised by herself. So she had to get a mentality, or that caused her to have a mentality of like, I gotta get it done, I gotta do it. Emotions have to be put to the side because I have to make a better circumstance for my family. Which in turn, like we got the same thing, right? Like um, we had to like do it, it's no complaints. We didn't get like growing up, like if you do something well, uh, you know how some parents like clap it up for you. She was like, I don't give kudos for you to do stuff that you're supposed to do. Like you're supposed to be doing it, you're not getting any kudos for me. So like my mentality was just like to do it, do it. If it's difficult, you just gotta get it done. But I was so angry from the absence father in some ways growing up with a mother that had some levels of trauma. So I'm trying to think of, of my experience. We, we just didn't talk about emotions. Um, we, we didn't talk about them. I, you know, I, was, I felt like I was taught to stuff my emotions, to hide them away and just keep moving. And I learned to sort of redirect them into action. So the whole idea of being a human being to me, it didn't make sense. I'm a human doing. I do. I do to, to deal with things that are going on inside of me. So I, I would say that um, even when I think about sports, which were a big part of my life, I played basketball, went into college, played ball, and had the vision of, you know, all, all the visions. And with that role, you hurting, you you in pain, you got another, we call them deep six, you got to run back and forth. You got to find another gear. You stuff that thing and go, right? So like the whole idea for me, and, and it worked really well in school. I transitioned that, use that in school. I don't worry about if I'm tired or whatever, just forget all that, just go, do your work. And now as an adult, oh shoot, that brother is a workaholic like crazy. Yeah, so it's kind of eerie, but that speaks and kind of echoes a lot of what Dr. Barnett and Dr. James were just talking about, just like, how black men and boys are taught from an early age that they need to stuff their emotions. And, and so that makes it difficult for them to even access them, you know, in adulthood. So I'll pass it along to Dr. Long. <laughs> We're going to be going back and forth and Dr. Jones is going to talk a little bit more about some of the um, other ways that we work in pediatrics to try to be, uh, have a preventive lens when we think about black youth mental health. Um, but I wanted to sort of take a step back for just a minute and share with you some of the ways in which we feel that primary care pediatricians um, are well positioned to be part of um, our nation's response to this crisis. So uh, I think this model has already been um, brought up before. Um, so lots of um, synergy here, but the first is that this idea that in pediatrics in our discipline, we have this social ecological approach 
approach to public health issues. So um, fundamental to how we think about caring for youth is that we recognize they don't exist in isolation. There's this complex web of relationships they have with their family and friends, with institutions such as schools and churches, uh, with their community, which includes cultural values and norms, and with their local, state, and federal governments who are making policy that affects them. So when we sit down with a patient, we know we need to work to gain understanding of who they are, of their context, of their unique risk and protective factors, cultural considerations, uh, the shape that mental health stigma um, may be playing in their in their journey and their level of trust or mistrust in the medical system. So these are all layers and considerations that I feel like in pediatrics we're really um, used to uh, kind of combing through and it's important for patients with asthma and it's important for patients who may have a mental health issue as well. Um, we also in, in pediatrics have this concept of the medical home, which is this idea that you can create a space, not necessarily physical space, but where you're caring for patients and families and it's accessible, it's family centered, it's comprehensive, it's coordinated and it's culturally effective. Um, and you can establish these trusting and longitudinal relationships there. Um, it also includes building partnerships with clinical specialists that will allow you to better support your patient's health. And one area where we've seen tremendous growth over the last 10 to 15 years is in this idea of integrated mental health. So embedding therapists, psychologists, even psychiatrists within the pediatric medical home um, to be a resource not only for the pediatricians that they're working next to, but also for the patients and families. So at Children's National Primary Care, we have what we call our whole bear care team, which means that two to three psychologists are embedded at each of our clinical sites, supporting triage, diagnosis, short-term treatment, and referrals to more specialized or long-term care when needed. And this model can really only realize its full potential when patients actually come in to access care uh, with us. And actually for adolescents, we have a lot of work to do in that area. So, you know, families and kids are really great about coming in with for vaccines and we're closely monitoring child development in those early years. And then that starts to fall off a bit in adolescents and maybe only about half of adolescents are seeking care um, in their primary care medical home. Um, so we've got some work to do to make sure that they're getting into the office. Um, and then lastly, there's some new investments in building a pediatric workforce that's better equipped to help manage the mental health concerns of their patients. We'll never have enough child and adolescent psychiatrists to see every patient who has a mental health disorder. The federal government has awarded over $180 million to fund pediatric mental health care access programs in 46 different states in DC. These are also known as child psychiatry access programs, and they're an innovative way to extend the pediatric mental health care workforce, which is that a general pediatrician can call um, in, in real time on the phone and speak to a child and adolescent psychiatrist who works in their state's uh, mental health access program to get help with making a diagnosis or a treatment plan or troubleshooting side effects from a medication, whatever the issue might be. They can also get referral and resource assistance for patients if needed. Um, these programs started out just supporting primary care pediatricians, but actually are expanding to support school clinicians um, as well as in emergency rooms. And then lastly, we have long known that our pediatric training programs need to shift more emphasis to educating future uh, pediatric clinicians about the signs and symptoms of mental health concerns, how to perform a comprehensive assessment, how to initiate treatment for common conditions. And starting in July of 2025, pediatric residency programs will be required to have their trainees do an additional month of training um, around treatment of pediatric mental health concerns. So we're hopeful that this leads to more graduating pediatricians with the skills that they need to better address common mental health concerns for their patients. Um, so hopefully you would agree with us that pediatricians are well positioned to be part of our response to this. Um, we're going to shift gears and kind of go back to Dr. Jones, who's going to talk some more about uh, prevention. Um, so prevention involves screening early. We use lots of screeners in uh, pediatrics and primary care. Uh, starting at like two years old, we're using the ages and stages questionnaire, uh, which focuses on social and emotional development. So that's our one our first clue, like there may be some type of external factor um, that might be attributing or contributing to the patient's behavior. Uh, as the kid gets older, we use the PSC-17, which is an additional screener. It also uh, screens for things like ADHD um, or other behavior issues, um, and, and it's just a screener. So while we know that ADHD is a real diagnosis, a lot of times behavior changes that are sudden and acute can be attributed to environmental factors. So maybe there was a death in the family, maybe um, dad went to prison, maybe uh, someone new moved into the home, maybe a new baby was born. And so just kind of like 
asking more questions and delving deeper into the, the cause of whatever the behavior is, um, is important. Um, and then as, as kids move into adolescence, we, we use the PHQ-9, which is a screener for depression um, and anxiety. Um, I think we can, we can go to the next slide. ACEs, uh, which are adverse childhood um, experiences or events, those also contribute a lot to the mental health of kids of all ages. So studies have shown that if you experience one ACE, you are two to five times more likely to experience depression and anxiety in adulthood. A lot of times our kids um, in, the, in the Black community are experiencing more than one ACE. So you can only imagine just their risk for developing de depression and anxiety. Um, next slide. So when I, when I inter encounter adolescents, I conduct what is called a HEADS assessment, which is kind of like a all-encompassing uh, screen for risk factor. So uh, one thing I ask about is drug use. Um, and I, I really don't care like if you are or are not, but what I care more about is how much you're using marijuana. So I ask kids, you know, do you smoke marijuana? They might say yes. I ask how much, and they might say every day. A lot of kids, uh, especially black boys and young adults say they smoke every day or several times a day. Um, and when I get down to why, these are the responses that I, I commonly get. Um, and so while the PHQ-9, which we use to, to screen for depression and anxiety might be negative, um, I get all of these responses um, about their marijuana abuse, um, which, is, which is kind of a crude screener for anxiety or, or depression that, that may be uh, missed if not, if we didn't ask more questions about this. Um, next slide. So we've covered quite a bit of this around screening um, with Dr. Jones, and then also Dr. James was alluding to this. So the only, I think, additional point I was going to make about screening and early identification um, is this idea that many of our screening tools may not be as effective in youth of color. So many were validated in white populations, and Black youth may express symptoms differently. And so these screening tools may not be as sensitive or accurate in picking up mental health health concerns. And that's true for when we're screening for depression, anxiety, and suicide. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we have the right tools in place to be able to do really effective screening. And thankfully, there's several federal funded, several federally funded studies underway um, to validate new screening tools in Black youth. Next slide. Um, so it's hard to talk about mental health assessment and treatment in one in one slide or one minute. So I think I just wanted to make a couple of points about pediatricians and how we might approach mental health concerns. And one important caveat might is that not all pediatric primary care providers are in the same comfort zone with mental health. So as I alluded to, we all have different, you know, trained at different times and with different concentrations. And so not everybody has had um, you know, sort of all the mental health background and, and knowledge that they've needed. There are definitely lots of programs out there where they can seek it after training, and hopefully we're going to be graduating a new um, crew of, of pediatric residents and, and independently practicing physicians who will have the tools that they need. Um, we also have educational support from professional organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics. They've got this great blueprint for um, suicide screening and managing suicide um, in the primary care setting. We also have support from our child psychiatry access programs that I was referencing earlier. So if you're a pediatrician practicing in a state that has um, a functioning uh, child psychiatry access program, they're a great resource for education and support. Um, and then we're building, you know, our systems, our training systems to be more adaptive for this work. Um, and then I guess just lastly, you know, even once an adolescent, you know, if they reached our office and they had a screening tool or they shared information with us, um, and we're able to work through an assessment and a treatment plan, we know that that's not the end of the story, that there's big systems barriers like systemic inequities coming from racism, from poverty. There's health systems barriers like insurance networks, um, which we're going to hear a bit more about, and wait lists and co-pays. There's um, patient and family level barriers like transportation and stigma, cultural mistrust of healthcare. Um, and studies show that only about half of the youth who have been seen in the ER for self-harm actually engage with outpatient treatment. And those rates are even lower if you look at them by, by race and ethnicity, they're lower for black youth. So um, fortunately there's some you know, work being done to look at new methods for enhancing connection to outpatient care um, for black youth in particular. Um, next slide. 
these are just a few resources we wanted to share from you from the Virginia Academy of uh, Pediatrics and from, um, I'm sorry, from the Virginia Mental Health Access Program and from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, and then there's some information here also about Dr. Jones's nonprofit, which is Raising Risers um, with the website and, and QR code for linking. Um, and I think that's it. We're welcome. Uh, you're welcome to contact us with any uh, questions or comments. Uh, we, we love to connect about this. So thank you. And Pervy, I believe you've got some slides. Um, I don't, but I don't have slides. I thought okay. I would just go ahead and, uh, and talk to you all um, about a different aspect uh, that is important, but not any more or less important than all the different things everyone has talked about. So let me just start with who I am. I'm Pervy Kempf. I'm the Deputy Executive Director here at the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority. That's the District of Columbia's uh, Affordable Care Act Marketplace. It, we are, um, you may know us as DC HealthLink, and that's where you come to get insurance if you are getting it for yourself, for your family, um, or your small business offering it to your employees. We um, here at DC Health can cover uh, 100,000 people across the country because employers have employees across the country, um, but they, they're um, DC businesses and DC residents. And um, out of these 100,000 people, um, you know, with that and with um, the Affordable Care Act, we've cut the uninsurance rate here in D.C. in half. And we are ranked number two now in the nation for the lowest uninsured rate. So wh why, why is that important? And what can you do with health insurance to highlight and improve access to mental health? Um, so many people have talked about uh, different barriers that exist to seeking coverage, to getting help, to getting the kind of help that's meaningful and can change your lives. Well, we um, here at uh, the DC Health Link in 2021 started a working group, a social justice and health disparities working group in the in the wake of COVID and the disparities we we're seeing um, with the murder of George Floyd, uh, with the crisis, uh, the economic upheaval. Um, that was going on to see what we could do. What is one of the things that we have control over that we could make a difference here to increase access to mental health? Um, we had um, the Ch Children's National Hospital as a participant on that on that working group, and you know they made the very poignant uh, statement: "We are on the cusp of losing an entire generation of Black and Brown children uh, due to mental health crisis here in DC." And I don't think it's dissimilar across the country. So we really talked about what can we do. So I'm gonna um, jump into what we did uh, with the recommendations from that working group, but I'm gonna start with something even more basic, um, which is uh, the Affordable Care Act, which passed quite a while ago, passed back in 2010. And uh, since then, um, and in all, vastly all insurance across this country, because of the Affordable Care Act, there are free, preventive benefits related to mental health. Um, there are free mental health screenings. So Dr. Long, Dr. Jones talked about different types of screenings you can get. I just want you to know that uh, no matter what kind of insurance you have, it is most likely going to cover that free screening, mental health screening, whether you're an adult or you're a child, whether you're doing it through a well child checkup or you're going in as an adult. It will also include alcohol and drug misuse screening and counseling for free. It is really important that, um, you know, that is one of the, the first steps in figuring out how we can help youth and adults dealing with the mental health crisis is that screening. So um, it, was, it was wonderful that the Affordable Care Act helped do this. It's in our Medicaid plans. It's in our private employer plans. If you're getting insurance through your employer, if you're getting it through an Affordable Care Act marketplace, um, it is it is free in all of those. So here in DC, we um, went one step further through the work of our social justice and health disparities working group and decided what can we do to really address 
what is um, a, a disproportionate impact um, that our uh, communities having in this case with pediatric mental health. We looked at look we looked at eliminating or reducing cost sharing for receiving those services. We worked with Children's National Hospital. We worked with Whitman Walker Health and a host of other um, consumer advocates. We worked with um, our Department of Insurance and others to really work through clinical scenarios of what kind of care we wanted to be able to provide for, for zero or little cost sharing. And in the end, what we were able to achieve and is the case now in our essential health plans on DC HealthLink, our essential health plans have uh, pediatric mental health means it's care that you would receive as an 18 year old or younger for mental health services, any condition that you have, any mental health condition, it could be anxiety, depression, um, any other condition, and you're gonna be able to access all of your medical visits, whether it's an initial visit, a medical evaluation and therapy follow-up, whether it's individual therapy or group therapy, whether it's in-person or telehealth, whether you're seeing your primary care doctor, a specialist or other type of therapist, all of those visits are $5 a visit. You do not have to meet your deductible first. If you know what I'm saying, um, it's that big dollar amount that sometimes you have to meet before your other types of, um, uh, before your insurance company starts covering more of, of that copay for you. Here it's $5 before you meet your deductible for those medical visits. We also cover prescription drugs for $5. A whole host and classes of prescription drugs um, are at $5 and some labs and imaging are also $5. So what does that mean? That means we know cost is a barrier. It's not the only barrier. We know provider access, stigma, um, finding culturally competent care. There are a lot of barriers. This is one area we were able to jump in, lower that barrier, which is to say, if I wanna go for, let's say six therapy visits, I don't have to be worried about paying a $45 copay every time I go. It just makes it a little bit harder to get there, makes it a little bit harder to prioritize in your budgeting. And it takes it down to $5. It's much easier. That's the barrier we were able to reduce. It's something that we called equity-based benefit design. Um, we've done it also with type 2 diabetes, where we were able to eliminate cost sharing. And just recently, we were able to eliminate cost sharing for cardiovascular and cerebral vascular disease. That's heart disease and stroke. Creating this equity-based benefit structure has allowed us to eliminate or lower cost sharing for these important conditions that have this disproportionate impact on our Black and Brown populations here in the District of Columbia. So again, this is our essential plan. So I'm going to give you an example. We have 27 different options in our individual market. That's if you're buying on your own. About 12 of those plans are essential plans. So there's a lot of them. And a lot of people are enrolled in them. And it's about making sure that folks know those benefits are there. That's one of the things that we're trying to do more education and outreach on um, and helping people stay connected to keep using the services that they need and to make this one barrier not a barrier. Um, the other thing I just want to highlight, which is also true for our essential plans, is that um, when you're enrolled in the essential plans, you can get, so let's say adult mental health services, don't get that $5 preference, but you can go pre-deductible to get mm -hmm. primary care visits, specialist visits, you can get generic drugs and urgent care, Include and you can get your outpatient mental and behavioral health before you meet your deductible. Deductibles can be thousands of dollars. So you will still pay the copay, but you do not need to meet the deductible to go ahead and make that appointment with a specialist or a primary care doctor or to seek medications um, with your regard to your mental or behavioral health needs. So again, um, these are our essential health plans. This is something that we are really looking to see if it helps increase utilization. It's one of the things that we are able to pilot here and we're hoping that others will be able to look at it. Some other states are also looking at it to see if this might be something that they're able to do. 
Um, I'm happy to um, take any questions, but I really want to say I appreciate the very um, frank conversation about all of the different aspects that go into considerations of how, what we need to think about, what we need to do, how we need to approach this problem from so many different ways to help a generation of, of youth and adults really connect with mental health care to help them. And it's wonderful to hear the stories of people who have found that link, have made that connection, have been able to um, make that change to keep their life going on a track that has been fulfilling and, and, and wonderful and to be able to share those stories. But it is a lifelong journey, which is why different barriers that we can break down, we all want to do it. So thank you again for having me here join you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Per um, Perby and Dr. Long and Dr. Jones. Um, thank you to the panelists, because behind the scenes, questions are being answered, so I appreciate that. So I will um, send the virtual mic over to our next introducer, um, which will be Patrice Gaines. She'll be introducing the next panel, and I appreciate you all so much. Hello, I'm, my name is Patrice Gaines. I, like B.B. Moore Campbell, I'm a writer, and uh, I am also a member of the task force. I wanted to take this opportunity as well to just say happy birthday to a nephew who uh, named Christopher, who is also a cousin then of Brandon, who spoke earlier. And Christopher uh, left us and went out into the world with an undiagnosed mental illness. Uh, health illness. But uh, while we don't know where he is in the world, we know he remains in our heart. The person that I'm going to introduce now is going to talk about um, her relationship with a beloved who also has um, is experiencing mental health challenges. When I was first introduced to uh, Cynthia Harrison, it was before she became the Arnable Cynthia Harrison, I read about her in a national article that was about her relationship with her son and her struggle to get the help that he needed and to get people to see the humanity in him as well. And so it was that first job of hers as a mother that led her to become a city council member in Ann Arbor, which is part of the work she does now. And so I introduce to you the Honorable Cynthia Harrison. Thank you so much for that introduction, Patrice. And thank you all for being here today and for allowing me to share my story. My son, my youngest son's story is one far too common in our community. Diagnosed with ADHD at the age of five and anxiety by the time he was a senior in high school. He needed understanding and support. Instead, a moment of emotional distress led to his on-ramp into the criminal legal system for a minor incident that occurred when he was 17. Black boys, men and their families are subjected to bias both inside and outside of our community. Not only do we have to navigate the generational trauma but we also confront damaging stereotypes about masculinity, blackness, mental illness, and substance use. These stereotypes exacerbate the challenges we face and hinder our efforts to seek justice and support. Witnessing the impact of adultification of black boys with mental illness firsthand is what ignited a fire within me. But when I considered running for city council, a new worry surfaced, and that was the stigma that me and my family would face. I knew the challenges I'd face, but would running for office expose my son to public scrutiny? As a mother, my instinct was to shield him and protect him. But then I realized my silence wouldn't protect him from the system. My son's story and the countless others like his needed to be heard. I decided to step into the arena for him and all the black boys and men struggling in a system stacked against them. Since taking office, I haven't wasted a moment. 
One of my first victories was passing a driving equality ordinance. This ensures minor traffic violations don't escalate into license suspensions, a burden that disproportionately falls on Black families. But most importantly, I wanted to limit unnecessary contact between law enforcement and civilians. In addition, I championed the use of marijuana excise tax funds to, prov to provide trauma-informed wraparound support services for those impacted by the carceral system. These programs offer a, life, a lifeline to those struggling just like my son. My son's journey is far, far from over, but it's stories like this that fuel my fight, like stories like his that fuel my fight for change. As a mother and city council member, I've witnessed the devastating impact on adultification on black boys with mental illness. My son exemplifies this. Diagnosed with anxiety and depression, he needed support and not handcuffs. In 2009, the moment of distress that I spoke of earlier that led him to being criminalized was for him kicking over a garbage can in the subdivision that we live in. This cycle of incarceration has haunted him ever since. The double standard is heartbreaking. My son deserved help, not punishment. Wealthy white families advocating for their children are praised while I face ridicule. This racial bias extends beyond the courtroom, affecting how black boys are perceived. My son's struggles were compounded by loss, a lot of loss, and that was the, the death of loved ones. These tragedies led to substance abuse and further entanglement with the system. Despite a lawyer's plea for mental health care, the system prioritized punishment. His entanglement with the legal system is a stark reminder of these failures. He needed real help, not just jail time. My advocacy and city council role are about creating a safe and supportive community for all. We need better systems of education and health care to ensure that all children can thrive. And I am working to fight for a reformed justice system. To my fellow, fellow Black mothers, I see you. We are warriors fighting for change. To our Black sons, we see you too. We're working to dismantle the biases and build a future where you are understood, supported, and empowered. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilwoman Harrison. I yield the mic now to our next person, Juanita Price. Good afternoon and still good morning. This segment uh, speaks to the role of mental health, community, village, family resources, and those tools that help us to make space so that we can deal with this most critical subject. One comment I would like to make before I introduce our panel, the life in expectancy in Washington DC where I serve for a black male is 65.2 years. The life expectancy for a white male is 83 years. Let's think about that as we will now hear from the Vente Pinnell panel, who uh, has a master's uh, license of professional counselor. Uh, da Vente grew up in Newark, New Jersey. He attended Howard University, where he earned his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy and Bachelor of Science in Psychology. He returned to Newark after uh, attending Howard, and he pursued his career as an artist which led him to teaching and developing an art therapy class hybrid program, which he implemented in an alternative education high school. He also attended New York University where he earned his master's of arts in counseling and mental health wellness. As a school-based therapist here at working for Hillcrest Children and Family Center, he is assigned to Woodson High School, which is 96% black, 
and 54% male. The Vente draws from his life experiences and uses his tests as testimonials to support his clients. His personal motto is make it good for something, which expresses an attitude that no matter what happens in someone's life, just make it good for something. Joining DeVente will be Courtney Lang. Courtney is the founder and CEO of Lango and Partners, Health, Justice, and Public Affairs. Courtney is the CEO, as I said, and uh, the public affairs entity which she manages uh, is a strategic communications firm recognized for advocacy, activism, and grassroots mobilization. Courtney advises clients on achieving health equity, access, affordability, structural racism, and the importance of systemic change amidst resilience. Courtney's commitment to improving the human condition and identifying social needs galvanizes public conversation and coalition building. So we will hear from DeVente and Courtney. Okay, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Uh, like Ms. Price said, my name is DeVente Panel. I'm a therapist, um, a licensed professional counselor in New Jersey and in Washington, D.C. And I work with Hillcrest Children and Family Center at a high school as a school-based clinician. And today, my part in this symposium is to present on community resources Basically, where can you go to get help? And I wanna start off by saying, black men are not a monolith. There's no way possibly I could speak for all of us, but I will share a little bit about my personal experience. And some of it may be generalizable, some of it may not apply to the actual black men that you know. You could go to the next slide. So I wanna start with my upbringing. I was born in Virginia and my parents were in the military. I moved back and forth from Virginia to New Jersey a couple of times until eventually we settled in New Jersey and I stayed there from fifth grade up through graduating high school. And so that's where I would say the majority of my adolescent years were spent. I attended Howard University for undergrad then NYU for my master's program. And in the midst of doing that, um, I would say from my experience, just being a black boy growing up into being a black man, living in a, I guess what you would call the hood and being in these academic and professional spaces, I got to see kind of a balance between the two. And in some ways they overlapped, some ways they didn't. My experience seeing like crime, drugs, gangs, just what goes on in the neighborhood is what I use now kind of helps me work with other black boys that are going through that today. But then my experiences in academic settings, how to talk quote unquote proper, how to write a resume, how to you know check all the professional boxes. That also helps me too, because that was my path towards like upward mobility. And so I know it can be used as a vehicle for some, but it doesn't have to be, it's not the only way. But in me going to school, getting a different lens, getting new language, I started to reflect on what it was like growing up in Newark. And it's like looking at something old with new eyes. So I wrote down a couple of sayings. We would say like, God made dirt, dirt don't hurt. You know, you drop a chip on the floor, got your five second rule, you might, you know, you might still eat it. And when I look at that now, later, um, it means something different to me. And that's the main thing I wanna focus on in my 15 seconds of fame right here is basically we need to call a spade a spade as black men. And I think the confusion that's perpetuated in our community keeps us from actually seeking and utilizing the mental health services. I don't feel like I have to tell black men where the mental health services are. We know where they are. We just don't wanna use them. We know where therapists, social workers, people exist, 
we just may not feel personally like we need it or that we want to take part in it or that we want to pay for or we want to take time out of our day to do that. You know, we have other ways. We may play the video game, we may play sports, we may lift weights. We have all these other ways to go about dealing with our mental health. So it's not a, I don't think the issue is about knowing where the resources are. I think it's on our part of a willingness to engage with those resources. So when I look at a statement like God made dirt, dirt don't hurt, I look at that as sometimes we pick and choose what we wanna remember. We suppress or repress experiences and memories and that can cause issues later. In my clinical work, I come across children, adolescents, families, couples, groups, where people often say, I'm angry, but I don't know why. Well, if you pick that chip up off the floor and you got a stomach ache later, you might say, I don't know why my stomach hurting, but you ate that chip off the floor and you pretended it never fell on the floor because you said, God made dirt, dirt don't hurt. Five second rule, if it ain't five seconds, it ain't really fall on the floor, it ain't really count. But there's a consequence to doing that, to us picking and choosing which part of our timelines actually means something. And I'm here to say the whole thing means something. Everything that you've been through in your life is a data point. And the more data points that you ignore, the more confusion it causes. It just seems like, I don't know why I feel like this. Well, you probably don't know why you feel like that because you've been ignoring like, the, you've been pushing so much stuff under the rug when you finally get a feeling, it's, it's not gonna be clear to you. So part of the work that I do clinically is to help people write out their timeline and go back through it. Basically relive their life experience a second time with new eyes so they can see, oh yeah, when I was a year old, my parents was fighting in the house. Even the parents would say, they too young to remember that. Consciously, they too young to remember that. Biologically, they are not too young to remember that because their body adapted to that environment. So then when they're in school, they're not sitting still and they're not paying attention, and they're getting diagnosed with ADHD or whatever the condition is, you know, we acting like the chip never fell on the floor. Um, not to go on a rant, but that's that's really the main essence of what I wanted to convey during my time, during my time here, um, that we need to cut out the confusion and really clarify what's going on. Um, therapy is one vehicle to do that, but again, I'm not here to push or sell therapy to you. As a Black man, I understand. You may not want to do it, you may not feel safe, you may not feel comfortable, but that's only one way. It's a thousand ways to skin a cat, as the saying says, so therapy is just one route. And for people that are, I guess, on the fence, like maybe they'll try it out. Therapy is, in essence, I guess what Freud will call, Sigmund Freud will call the talking cure. There's something healing about telling your story, about using your voice, saying words. Um, therapy is also a relationship, but if you look at the very last point, it's what you make it. You can look at it, finding it, finding the right therapist, quote unquote, kind of like dating, but also what you build with your therapist is gonna be unique. It's not gonna be based on um, necessarily on who they are, what they look like. I know some people get caught up on, oh, I want a black therapist, I want a white therapist, I want a male therapist, a female therapist. At the end of the day, um, if we get caught up on what it looks like, we might miss out on what it could be like potential. So you may not be in an environment where you can find the perfect therapist, or you may just have anxiety that's getting displaced. So now you're nitpicking this person and you ain't even giving them a chance. Um, on this slide, the most important part is a, a question at the bottom, can the same man live in an insane environment? We live in a country that was built on punishing black men, capitalizing off of us, the legacy of slavery, the civil rights movement, um, Jim Crow laws, all of that's ongoing. It's designed for us to go to jail or die. When I see the numbers about black men, black men and boys committing suicide at these high rates, I'm not surprised. And as black men, I think it's crucial that we're aware of it. But at the same time, look at the music. Look at there's so much of society is built around. So much money is made off of our destruction. And so I think as black men, we do need to be aware of that so that we can make better decisions. Um, we go to the next slide. Where can you get help? Hillcrest Children and Family Center is available to DC residents. So if you're in DC, that's one of the community providers you can go to. I work in private practice. I have your favorite therapist, LLC. 
So I work in New Jersey and then you see, but there's other private practice therapists that you can meet on psychology today. You can go through your insurance, call your insurance company, say, hey, I'm looking for therapy. And they have therapists that's in network. You can call 988 or it may not be therapy, right? It may just be your cousin, brother, mother, friend, coach. That's a trusted person. You go to the next slide. And then this last uh, slide is basically a picture that I like to draw. It's the roads that push through concrete. Just to end on a positive note, like I think it's great that we have in this symposium. I think that it's great that we're becoming more aware of what's going on with Black men. And I just want to say it's by design. So as Black men, we need to basically fight back, like tighten up, like call a spade a spade, address the real issues. Look at your timelines. Find out why you are how you are. Look at how money is generated from our destruction and then don't participate. And um, yeah, that's basically my spiel. I'll... Thank you so much, Devante. I want to begin with the end. The conclusion of our program is where Linda started us. The importance of mental health advocacy. We are all advocates on this symposium, and we want you to join us with a passion for both equity and advocacy. Whether you're a peer, a patient, a provider, a family member, a friend, a loved one, a caregiver, a community member. Mental health advocacy is grounded in the need to continue to raise the voice and the mobilization. This, in fact, is the spirit of B.B. Moore Campbell, why we are gathered here today, to honor a legacy of advocacy and equity. I also want to acknowledge the tremendous work that laid the foundation for this gathering the NAMI Mommies of NAMI Urban LA. I would be remiss if I didn't name them individually. Lynn, Bunny, Joe Helen, Nancy, Rosina, Judy, and of course to Ellis and Alicia, who continue to carry the light of the work. When we think about mental health advocacy, we're promoting, we are increasing access, we are combating stigma, and we are looking at ourselves locally, state, nationally, but also as an individual in the healthcare system. Next slide. Our work on this movement is really grounded in the 2020 pandemic phenomena. George Floyd was murdered and then the mental health crisis started growing in visibility. With that, B.B. Moore Campbell's name was being removed from the month of July. And so we are here as a community of stakeholders and supporters to make sure that we do not erase B.B.'s name from National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. Thank you, Dr. Anel Prim and Karis Jan Myrick for holding the light of consciousness for the work. Next slide. Our advocacy requests are really simple. We want the participants on this call and your communities broadly to continue to write your members of Congress to make sure that any individual who's recognizing National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month includes B.B. Moore Campbell's name. It is critical that we continue to work as a collective with the Congressional Black Caucus, the Tri Caucus, and hold our federal, state, and county officials accountable. We also want to make sure that when we're holding individuals accountable, that we're looking at 988 promotion, visibility, and awareness, and making sure that Black and Brown people are answering our crisis calls in community. We want to support the message that treatment works. And so we owe a debt of gratitude to the American Psychiatric Association, and of course, the Black Psych Psych Psychiatrists of America, who also continue as partners 
on this journey with us at the community level. Next slide. Next slide, Gabriel, thank you. Our mental health resources that we want to share with you, I just mentioned the BPA, there's a directory that was a part of the larger Community Health Equity Alliance resource guide. Free mental health screenings are available in community. Mental Health America has been wonderful about socializing how to take a test. And there is a parallel effort around the Commission on Black Men and Boys. Congressional hearing occurred in May. We need more voices to amplify the education and the visibility of the work. This resource guide will be made available to the attendees of this symposium. So stand with us, please, next slide, to make sure that we continue to address these three fundamental questions in community. Who do I call? What do I do? Where do I go? This is the accountability that we need to make sure that these questions are fundamentally answered. If a resource is made available and you can't help to navigate an individual to care, then we have not satisfied Bibi's mission to make sure that there is equity in the system. And last but not least, I want you to focus on the headlines. And our headlines are very clear that there have been numerous deaths of Black men and boys at the hands of whether it's law enforcement or others in community. We want to raise the visibility that while equity is being challenged across the nation in states and places that are creating unsafe zones, that we as stakeholders committed to the cause are going to hold the headlines accountable so that we can be together in community holding the light and consciousness for ourselves and our loved ones. We're healing each other in the spirit of B.B. Moore Campbell. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors and partners. We are gonna open it up for Q&A. Linda, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Courtney, and thank you to all of our presenters today. We've heard a wealth of information. You've heard the problem. You've gotten information about the crisis. We learned some of the solutions. And you heard the call to action. We need each of you to be a part of the village to address this issue of mental health illness in our Black community and in other communities of color, Black boys and men, mental health crisis, care, and community. We will now open it up to questions. If you have any questions, we are here to answer them. Gabriel, are there right. any questions we, in the chat? We are gonna try some live questions. So we're gonna start with John. John, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I have something in common with one of your speakers. I'm uh, in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and uh, that's neighbor to Ann Arbor. And our community does have some issues with uh, Black youth. And uh, my son has had problems since he was about 14. And what it is is we have a, a situation where they get entangled with the law and it's like they keep them uh, engaged and they bring up things in court that make them look like they're ha habitual offenders when it's for things like tail lights out. Now they want to have uh, surveillance cameras in the neighborhoods. And uh, to me, that's inappropriate when you're using that to uh, cause further uh, punishment for poverty. And uh, we're we're sort of trying to get funds appropriated through millages to address the situation. We found in Washington County, a lot of funds uh, go through the sheriff's office and the board of county commissioners. And our efforts 
or to try to get them to respond to the needs. But politics and running for office obscures a lot of facts. And uh, it, it takes a community uh, level of uh, participation to make a difference. And I think that this is uh, a way to get people together because we are faith-based also in We Rock. It's Washtenaw County, uh, it's Washtenaw Regional Organizing Coalition, and we deal with faith, labor, and community. And I appreciate you, your efforts. I, I do want to know if uh, there is uh, uh, any experience in dealing with uh, millages and stuff. If anyone knows anything, maybe they can respond and see what might be an action that we could take. Thank you. Thank you, John. And that question is to all the panelists that would like, anyone that would like to take it. And, and Gabriel, uh, that villages? I'm sorry, Cynthia, you can go ahead and take that in Michigan. Yeah, so I'll take the question. Um, I, you know, I'm the city council member in Ann Arbor, which is kind of sister city to Ypsilanti. Um, I'm trying to, there was a lot there and there is a lot there. Uh, I guess my, my first question, sorry, didn't catch the gentleman's name, Mr. The first uh, question I would have for you is, have you had the opportunity to speak to your um, your city council member um, or your uh, county commissioner or you know make an appointment to to speak with them about some of your concerns or your experiences? I, I also would be happy to speak with you. I'm I'm my purview is over the city of Ann Arbor, but I do a lot of volunteerism. Um, in the reentry space in the county. So I don't know if that answered your question, but you can feel free to reach out, out to me if you feel that may help. <laughs> Thank you. I will pass the question asking now to Ayana. Can you hear us? Possibly not. So next person, Adrian. No worries, because there's plenty of questions. So here you go then. I'll go into the Q&A. What does a parent do to encourage the adult child to engage in professional consultation when they talk about exclusively with his parents for hours on end and we are not able to speak objectively? I'm sorry, Gabriel, can you repeat that? Of course. The question was stated as, what does a parent do to encourage the adult child to engage in professional consultation when they talk almost exclusively with his parents for hours on end and we are not able to speak objectively? So it almost sounds as though, how do you tell someone nicely to go to a third party or someone that is unbiased that could actually provide therapy consultation versus speaking, I mean, it's great to have a relationship with your parents and your family, but sometimes you can't be as direct because you're biased and your care for them and how you feel for them, essentially. Okay, no, we, well, just had, we, we just had, uh, Dr. James can speak to this. I'll just say that we just had uh, an author, uh, April Simpkins, who lost her daughter to suicide, uh, Miss USA, uh, 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 Chesley Chris. And she talked about um, uh, what uh, she's doing with the rest of her, her her young people in her house that are approaching adulthood from the standpoint of letting them see she's role modeling the behaviors and also sharing with them uh, her outreach. And she she's been doing it for quite some time from even even while Chesley was with us in terms of letting them know that she is uh, 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 seeking therapy and in therapy and making sure they see her and her whole self. And what she shared with us uh, uh, recently is that uh, a lot of times our young people in, 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 in homes will role model what they see. And if we can show our vulnerability, um, um, it, it, it can help them. So I'm not sure if 
the context of that is that this is someone else's family that the young person's listening to, but I, I just wanted to share that as it was an aha moment in terms of role modeling that which you you want your young, young person to see. And she wanted them to see there was resilience, recovery, and also that she was uh, using services. Um, um, so uh, I would offer that to you. Thank you. We're going to try a live question again. We have a Thomas F. Chapel Jr. If you have a question, please do ask. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't know too much about mental health. Um, my thing was when I was coming up, uh, it took a village and our parents were more engaged as well as the neighborhoods and other family members and friends that we were able to uh, communicate with. And the one thing I can remember as a child was that we all sat down at the dinner table at one time and we talked about everything under the sun. If there was a television at the table, it was basically doing current events, you know, everything newscasts talk about what's going on in the world, everybody's feelings. I know when I was coming up as 80s rolled in, um, everything went a different way because technology, jobs, and things like that came into play. And now you have more parents that are focused on working and then spending time with their kids. So now their kids are left to certain devices. I had an opportunity uh, to become a single dad and I raised my son and I talked to him profusely. I drag a lot of stuff out of him. I don't drink, I don't smoke, uh, anything like that. And I raised him in the same substance as well as drinking and smoking and raised him to become his own uh, his own individual as well as uh, being able to be his own entrepreneur. I just recently wrote a book and my book is on men, health and wealth. That's how I was titleized. And one thing I realized is that uh, as a young child, once again, we were taught not to express ourselves. You know what I'm saying? That's what girls do, you know? And men grew up, and relatives of my men, because I grew up without a father, they will beat you to make you tough. You know, don't, don't, it don't hurt, take it, accept it, this, that, and the third, to where now those pillars that was in the community are either no longer here or they gotten so old that they don't want to be bothered anymore. And that's one of the things I have an issue with, you know, because I see what's going on in the world and I'm like, what are we doing? Where's, where's our leaders at? Where's our church at? Where, where, where are these people at? You know, and it's just very, very tough to raise a child in this world now because of all the different, um, functions of what's going on is happening. So if anyone wants to uh, challenge what I'm saying, please enlighten me because I'm not feeling what's going on. I'm so listen, I, I don't want to, I don't want to challenge it, but let me speak up as a father. Uh, and also in, in my, in my role. And, and, and I want to give you some hope and you see it behind me. Um, everybody here is doing this because they care and people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you see this young man right here from Howard University and NYU, uh, he, he had many choices and he's given back to the community and working in the community. And I say that because I have a young man that graduated from Howard, you know, and 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 he will always be black. And, and no matter whether he, you know, uh, uh, summa cum laude or, or speaks Japanese or any of that, his 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 uh, community is is critically important to his success. When I, I want to give you some hope from the standpoint of what Dr. Barnett said last Friday, we were in Harlem, New York at, at uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Al Sharpton's, a uh, Reverend, excuse me, Reverend Al Sharpton's National Action Network with a congressional uh, hearing. Uh, Congress was there. Uh, Courtney knows this, uh, this, this group, and it was a part of our panel. And uh, black men, uh, black, black boys, black men, and suicide. And where I want to give you some hope is that there's a young man that reminds me of the gentleman here, Devante, that drove up with almost 40 young black boys, young men between 14 and 18 that are all going into medical school. They were all, uh, Dr. James, they were all in their white coats and they were sitting there in the audience. 
Um, and this young man, as well as a couple of other young adults were mentoring them. So there is some hope. There are some things going on that we don't get to see. Uh, we, we often get to judge the book by its cover. I want to take you into the table of contents and the chapters. There's some good stuff happening. You keep hope, you know, great job in, in raising your son as a, as, a, as a single dad. Way to go. But don't don't lose hope. Yes, the community has changed. But there are some young people that have stepped up and are stepping in to mentor these young people. And I wish I had a picture to share with you because these these were some incredible young men in white coats that were all selecting to go into medicine. And because they are coming out of high school, they need some support in their journey so that they stay in that journey. Thank you, Dan. And it's officially three o'clock. So for the official thank you note, I will yield the mic to Dr. Linda Wharton Boyd. Thank you so much. And thank to, to each of the panelists, each of our speakers, you did a wonderful job in preparing us with what we need to do to raise the awareness. And as Dr. James said, the, the alarm has been sounding for a while. It is now time for us to take action. Courtney gave us the call to action. Dan gave us information on what this problem looks like. Jay Barnett gave his personal experience. Brandon gave his personal experience. Dr. Long and Dr. Jones talked about what they are doing in their community. The question becomes, what will you do? The problem is before us. We need you to be committed and to address a call to action. So thank you, Courtney, Devante, Juanita, Cynthia Harrison, Kirby Kemp, Dr. Jones, Dr. Long, Brandon Williams, Keith Montgomery, Dr. Regina James, Dr. Jay Barnett, Gabriel, Marquetta Wills, Dan Gillison, Albert Wynn, and each of you who saw it not robbery to join us today to talk about Black boys and men, mental health, crisis, care, and community. We thank you for being a part of the community and we thank you for joining us today. This information will be found on the website of NAMI as well as APA and the B.B. Moore Campbell Task Force website. Copies of the, um, of the script for, from today's presentation will be sent to each of you who joined us through the registration link. We thank you, thank you. Oh, I didn't see Judy and Patrice and all of you for being a part of this. This is a wonderful, wonderful dialogue. And we need to continue the dialogue. We need to continue to raise the issue so that we get to solutions to the problem. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.